Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm very pleased to be invited to be here with you today. So this is, this is really great. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, good? I have energy for, for one more? Great. So I'm excited to build on some of the themes that we've been talking about today and uh, discuss a technology that's really seeing an incredible pace of development. Uh, but I'll start, I'm curious, how many of you in the room have actually tried a virtual reality headset before today? OK. Uh, and I'll flip it. How many of you have actually never tried uh, a virtual reality headset? Still, still some hands. So we see that the technology is, is still um, being deployed. Uh, for those that haven't tried it, I can show you a picture of what most people's uh, first time is like. It's smiles, it's exciting, it's happy butterflies. Uh, in some rare cases, this can also uh, be your first experience. <laughs> we won't let this happen to you, so, so, so no worries. Now, one of the themes that we've been talking about is that many of the technologies that we're discussing today aren't new. And that's actually true of, of, of both augmented and virtual reality as well, but especially virtual reality, which has been around for several decades. Uh, but what has recently happened in the last few years uh, 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 because of this acquisition, so this was uh, a few years ago, Facebook acquired a company called Oculus Rift. Uh, they're a manufacturer that makes one of the most popular uh, consumer headsets. And they acquired this company for $2 billion, which was a pretty incredible uh, price point. Now, um, because of this acquisition, for the very first time, even though the technology has been around for a while, we're now in the era of the first time where this is now an affordable consumer uh, technology. Now, to understand why Facebook spent so much money on this technology and to really understand what makes virtual reality the technology that it is, there's really just two things that you would really need to understand. So the first is it improved on what's called the field of view, which is kind of what it sounds like. The, you know, the human vision is actually 210 degrees uh, of vision. So this is a, a headset had 110 degrees, which essentially means when you put the headset on, there's no edge to the screen. When you look around, you're entirely immersed inside these, these digital environments. Now, the second component, and probably the more important aspect of what makes this technology so important, is that it improved on a concept of what's called latency. Latency is a term used to describe how long does it take the computer to render the image of what you're supposed to see based on where your head is moving. And even just a millisecond of delay is enough to cause the nausea that many people have associated with this technology for the last few years, and actually quite a bit longer than that as well. So because uh, Oculus improved on these two components at a price point that is now affordable. This has really been enough to kickstart this new emerging world of, of consumer virtual reality. And it's been a very exciting time to, to be in the space. But the question that we need to address before we get into this is what's the big deal? Why do we care? Why are we spending time uh, talking about this? Now, imagine some of you in the room, you know, you're working at big industrial manufacturing companies and you're wondering why are we talking about a device that's most often associated as being a gaming platform. Well, this is a company, uh, Wessel's company. It's a 110-year-old uh, manufacturer that's in the business of, of producing industrial pressure tanks. So you can think, you know, very heavy industry. Uh, they're a 110-year-old business, so they've been around for quite a while. Now, this is a photo of a water bladder expansion tank, so it moves uh, heat through HVAC systems. Now, the way this company used to sell these pressure tanks is they had a marketing budget of half a million dollars, and with that budget, they could go to one trade show every year. It was usually in Las Vegas, where they would build a composite sample of their, their water tank, and whichever customers happened to come to that trade show would be the customers that they could do business with and interact with. Now, a few years ago, some uh, very marketing savvy person in their marketing department had the idea, well, why don't we create a virtual reality version of this product? Uh, and so they did that. And inside of an immersive virtual environment, you can get a sense for what the tank looks like, how it functions, how it would feel in your, in your uh, HVAC system. And as a result of this, with that same half a million dollar budget, they can now go to essentially any trade show in the world that they, they could possibly uh, send someone with a, with a headset. And so the point here is that they completely digitized, in this case, the sales process. But with, with, with virtual reality and augmented reality as well, essentially experiences themselves become subject to the properties of software. And software and digital experiences is, is sort of the theme of what we're talking about in this, in this conference. And that's a really big deal. Now, really the core of, of, of what I'd like to explore with you today 
is this exponential improvement in some of the manufacturing procedures that we're going to see as a result of this. So according to Bell Helicopters, one of the world's leading manufacturers of uh, helicopters, it normally takes anywhere between five and seven years to design, uh, build, and deploy a new helicopter. And you can imagine, you know, it's a very complex set of tasks. You have to build uh, sample parts and test them and do collaborative focus groups. But now what they do is they have their engineers go inside of a fully immersive virtual experience, they can work on a CAD file, and they can get immediate feedback ab about exactly what their design looks like. Does it function? Does it work well? They can do focus groups with a pilot without having to build any physical component. And in doing this, they were able to build and deploy this helicopter in six months. It's a 10 times improvement in the speed, and according to the company, they saved millions of dollars in their design process using virtual reality in this way. So that's really the core of what I'd like to explore with you today, this idea that we're going to see improved efficiencies, reduced errors, and lowered cost as a result of deploying these technologies in your manufacturing procedures. Now, there's really two core pillars of, of what I'd like to talk to you uh, about. And the first is this idea that to really understand the history of computing uh, and to place the, the, these technologies in the context uh, that we're going to speak about is to understand them as a new interface. Now, uh, to understand computing, you really have to understand the progression that interfaces have had over time. So keep in mind that you know, built, working with computers, communicating with computers, used to be a very complex uh, skill set. It involved physically rewiring a machine. You know, the programming language, so to speak, used to involve physically rewiring a computer. Uh, then a new interface came along that was a bit more efficient. It was still required a lot of training. Uh, to become comfortable with it, the punch card system. Maybe the first real breakthrough uh, was the invention of the command line. This is not the first time we've actually seen this today. Jonathan Knowles showed this. But this was a big breakthrough. It was the first time that communicating with a computer re required just typing you know, words onto a, a computer screen. But again, you still had to learn command lines and, and certain scripts. Maybe the real mainstream moment, uh, and this is something my uh, Jody, who you heard from this morning, talks a lot about, this idea the, the graphical user interface, the first time that working with a computer involves clicking on pictures, this was what enabled my, my parents, for example, to finally be able to, to use computers. Now, the, the point is, at every step in the progression of all of these interfaces, it enabled more people to be able to participate in this environment. And that's a really important aspect of what we're talking about. And really what we're seeing with the development of augmented and virtual reality is this next new great interface. And in fact, it's so new, we don't really have a good term for this. As my editor, uh, Jason at, at Singularity Hub, wrote this article, we have terms like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, there's you know, mixed reality, XR, MR, all of these terms, it's complicated. How do we keep track of this? And just to address a very common question, what's the difference between augmented and virtual reality? In the case of virtual reality, typically, you're referring to an environment where you're fully immersed inside this digital environment, as opposed to augmented reality, where you still have your surroundings, uh, you're, you're still grounded in, in your surroundings around you, but you have some kind of information, whether audio or visual, helping you, much like we see uh, Google Glass, which was a, a very famous example of this. But what connects these technologies and unifies them as a concept is this idea that they involve the use of three-dimensional space. And that is a very big deal. And this is something that Jody, as a, as a designer, as an interface designer, uh, has really um, sort of, of, of done a lot of research on and, and, and talked about, is, is, is human mind, we're very much a 3D thinking thing. You know, as babies, we're born into this world, and we, we navigate and, and figure things out by moving our arms. And, 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 and reaching out and grabbing things. It's only as adults where we're asked to learn this you know, relatively complex skill of moving a mouse on a, on a two-dimensional screen. Now, I can kind of point to one example where we see this in, in, in practice. Now, you might wonder, why is it that we don't see many of our grandparents playing video games? You know, the, the, the motor skills of pressing buttons on a gamepad, it's not an easy skill set. Uh, and don't be fooled by this very crisp-looking image. When I Google, grandparents playing video games, this was the only image that I could find. So it's not a very common thing. You can tell they probably don't really know what, what, what's going on here. But now consider, how many of our grandparents do we see routinely playing with something like the Nintendo Wii? The Nintendo Wii, as an interface, it's far more intuitive. You, you pick it up and you know what to do. You move your arms. And if you Google images of grandparents playing Nintendo Wii, 
we see that it's actually very popular. And, and this makes sense. It's, you, know, you don't have to understand the complex motor skills. Again, and this is what's coming to our computing interfaces. It's not, this, this will enable many more people to, to be able to participate in this environment. Now, why should we care about this? Why is this a big deal? So Jody talked about this morning the skills gap uh, and, and the idea that we're going to be short uh, uh, people to, to perform certain jobs. And so consider the case of cybersecurity. And this is incredibly important in the, in the manufacturing space, especially as we connect more of our equipment to a network. So we'll have you know, sensor-enabled uh, industrial equipment, smart factories. But it's expected that in the next few years, we're going to be short almost 2 million trained network analysts. And, to, and part of the reason for this is to become a network analyst requires a certain set of skills. You have to understand Python scripts and forensic analysis and be comfortable looking through log files. But what if being a network analyst were as easy as navigating a three-dimensional video game? So in a virtual environment, that's the idea behind this concept. This is a company uh, called ProtectWise. And the way this works, every building you see in this virtual city represents a connected device on a company's network. So the shape of the building tells you what kind of device. Is it a mobile phone? Is it a server? Is it you know, a wind turbine on, on your grid? Uh, the height of the building tells you information about the bandwidth. The width tells you information about the net flow activity. Then you can group those buildings into different neighborhoods. So maybe you have one neighborhood for a factory in Singapore. You have another for your, uh, you know, your, your uh, energy grid in, in Bangkok. Uh, you have another neighborhood for your executive team. So what this means, as a network analyst, instead of sitting behind a computer and looking at log files, they put on a virtual reality headset, and they step into this virtual environment and patrol your IT infrastructure almost as if they were a police officer. So when I interviewed the CEO of this company, he made the point that in the next few years, if your company has a large IT infrastructure, and most manufacturing companies going forward will certainly have large IT infrastructures, that this will be uh, how you know, you'll have rooms of people that essentially do the bulk of their work inside of a virtual environment. Now, there's really two core types of, and we'll, we'll shift a bit into augmented reality, and I'd, I'd really like to get into the core of, of what we're going to talk about uh, as it relates to a range of manufacturing procedures, so things like maintenance, assembly, repair, training, and there's really two core types of, of augmented reality that I'd like to discuss. The first is uh, what's called assisted reality, and this is the term that, that some companies are starting to use uh, as, as marketing language. You actually heard it in the video that Michael showed this morning uh, when he showed the, the heads-up display. But maybe the easiest way to, to think about this is something that we can all probably relate to in our, uh, in our lives. So if any of you have had the frustrating experience of trying to assemble furniture, typically the way we do this is we rely on a series of you know, two-dimensional line diagrams. And there's this mental mapping that's required to shift from looking at these line diagrams into the physical real world and navigate these, these steps. But what if assembling something like an IKEA furniture were as simple as actually seeing the furniture being assembled in front of you in three-dimensional space? You imagine that the error rate would go down. It's probably far less likely that you'll make mistakes if you can see this actually being assembled in front of you. This is actually not an IKEA project. This is a designer uh, and, and programmer in Canada, Adam Picard, who, who, who demonstrated what this uh, might look like. Now, I can show you a range of examples of companies that are starting to experiment with exactly this type of assisted reality. And if you are also yourselves working on this, I hope you'll come and find me because I collect these examples and I like to profile them in these kinds of presentations. Uh, this is a company that, that uh, is based in, in Germany, uh, Tyson Krupp. They're an elevator manufacturer uh, and, and maintenance company. And so they've experimented with removing the field guides that, that their technicians take out into the field to perform their maintenance work. And now in a hands-free environment inside of Microsoft HoloLens, they get information about serial numbers, the components, the repairs that need doing. And in their early experiments, they were able to take work that routinely took upwards of an hour or more for each technician, and now they do the same work in about 20 minutes. So that's a reduction of it's a third of less time. So more time, they can do more jobs in a single day, it's more efficient. 
Now, there's really two companies that I personally have been uh, focused on in my research, uh, really trying to understand the space. I don't mean to suggest that these are the only companies working on this, uh, but these are the two that I've, I've personally done uh, research with. Uh, and the first I'd like to talk about is a company called Scope AR. And essentially what Scope AR is doing is, is creating these kinds of assisted reality heads-up instructions for a whole range of, of capabilities. In fact, they give you, the user, the ability to create your own kind of uh, augmented reality three-dimensional instructions. Again, this is that spatial interface that's far more intuitive to use. Uh, that doesn't require CAD files. You don't need to you know, base this on a CAD file. You can kind of do drag and drop and, and create your own augmented reality instructions. Now, probably the most interesting anecdote is from Scope AR is work that they've done with Lockheed Martin in partnership with NASA. Now, NASA is in the process of building the Orion spacecraft. So this is a, a space capsule that's being designed with the intention of flying to Mars sometime in the next decade. Now, Lockheed Martin has, of, of course, mastered or, or figured out how to create uh, assembly lines to, to mass produce uh, their, their products. But the challenge with something like the Orion spacecraft is that they only make a few of these. You can't mass produce, uh, so it's a very bespoke kind of manufacturing uh, process. Now, the result of that is that a technician is usually handed a binder of you know, 3,000 pages. Imagine a 3,000 page you know, IKEA furniture assembly guide. That's essentially what these technicians are asked to work with. Now, in the old world of assembling, a technician has to go to this binder, he has to look up the correct table, he has to memorize the torque setting, find the fastener, before he can then go into the, the spacecraft and then torque in the fastener and, and assemble it. Then he has to wait for quality assurance to come in and, and approve his work before he can move on to the next fastener. That takes a long time. Now what they have is a process where inside a HoloLens, he has a full heads-up instruction, no paper diagrams. They've completely eliminated the, the user guide. He can see exactly what the fastener, what the torque setting is, do it, and then he can use the, the camera on the, on the device to take a picture that quality assurance can, can use to approve, and he can immediately, or they can immediately move on to the next, you know, the next step. Doing it this way, they've reduced the time it takes to train a technician to be able to assemble this spacecraft by 85%. And they've been able to replicate these efficiencies in other manufacturing procedures across their business at a range of anywhere between 42 and 46% improvement in their efficiency. Now, there's another company that's, that's working in this space called Upskill. Uh, that has partnered with uh, Google Glass, um, you might remember from, from 2013. Uh, and so an example that they've, they've demonstrated, they work with a company like Boeing. And you can imagine the complexity of wiring. You know, people forget how much wiring and cable goes into a Boeing airplane. Uh, and you can kind of see the, the mental shift that has to go back and forth to look at this two-dimensional uh, understanding. Sometimes they work from these 20-foot uh, flowchart diagrams to get a sense of what to do. Now, using these glasses, they can get the real-time information about exactly how to wire up an airplane. So their results, they saw a 40% improvement in efficiency, 30% reduction in the time it takes, but maybe most interesting, they saw a 90% increase in, in what's called first-time quality. It's essentially a fancy way of saying that their error rate just completely evaporated. They almost never make mistakes when they do this. And maybe the easiest way to, to demonstrate this visually, this is a video of a, a GE wind turbine uh, control box operator. On the left, he's working with a traditional uh, series of line diagrams and a user manual. And on the right, he's got a, a pair of glasses with the software demonstrating exactly how to, how to, to, to manufacture or to, to wire up this, this wind turbine. Saw a 34% improvement in, in this process. And so, you know, this is the VP of production at, at, at Lockheed Martin. He says, if you look five years down the road, I don't think you'll find an efficient manufacturing operation that doesn't have this type of augmented reality to assist the operators. I mean, this is, this is what's coming. Now, the next kind of, of augmented reality essentially leverages what I've just showed you with this assisted reality concept and combines that with video communication. Now, this becomes a really big deal because this will have an impact on how manufacturing companies deploy labor uh, within their companies. Uh, so to get a sense of, of what I'm talking about, and, and the term is, is today it's called see what I see, which is a very literal uh, term. I don't believe that that will be the term that will, will stick around forever. 
Uh, but essentially the way this works is you can have an untrained professional or technician trying to figure out how to, to navigate some process, while a trained expert who before would have had to themselves go out into the field to do whatever uh, diagnosis or repair or maintenance is needed, and can give the three-dimensional assisted reality real-time instruction for how to uh, perform some task, you know, perform some maintenance work, et cetera. Now, uh, one of the clients that works with this uh, process, this, this, scope, this is a scope concept, uh, is a client called Prince Castle. Now, Prince, Can uh, Prince Castle manufactures the uh, fryers, microwaves, uh, and, and appliances that fast food companies uh, use in their, in their stores. And so if a fryer breaks down, there's not usually someone at Burger King or McDonald's or KFC that knows how to fix these, these appliances. And so they rely on a team of general contractors to come in, and, and often these general contractors don't actually know what or have never worked with these devices. And so as a result of this, the first time diagnosis rate, so the, the, the rate at which they could correctly diagnose the issue on the first try, was pretty poor. Now what this company does is they rely on essentially an, an augmented reality call center, where instead of having an expert having to come out and fly out to the, to the place to, to see where, what needs fixing, they can do a diagnosis right there with a, with a video communication function and, and demonstrate exactly what needs to happen. And according to the CEO of, of Scope, their first time diagnosis rate today is nearly 100%. I mean, that's, I, I, that's almost a, that's an astounding improvement. And just to get a sense of, of how significant this, this sort of labor deployment, and I imagine many of you in your businesses are spending money and time sending your experts out into the field. If something breaks down, someone has to get on a plane and go out into the world to solve this problem. Uh, a few months ago, I was, I was chatting with a, a client of, of Singularity University. This is a Norwegian uh, company that manufactures the fish processing and fish handling equipment that goes on industrial fishing boats in Norway. Now, this company has a team of about 50 trained uh, technicians who do repairs when this uh, equipment goes down. Now, in a bizarre example, if one of the fishing boats is scheduled to go out to sea, but the equipment is still broke, uh, broken down, that technician is required to actually go out to sea, even if it means that they'll be gone sometimes for up to 30 days at a time. And that's a cost that the company has to take on. Uh, that's a, a person that's no longer available to actually go out into the world uh, and perform these tasks. So again, this see what I see video communication with this augmented reality concept is going to completely transform how labor gets deployed in your, in your business and, and, and really uh, reduce costs and improve efficiencies in, in some interesting ways. And again, these are the, the two companies that I've, that I've profiled. Now, for the time that we have left, I'd really like to just briefly uh, explore this idea of what I'm, I'm calling digital worlds, but it's a, it's a, it's a term to describe this, this idea that we're going to create these virtual environments uh, that we'll spend time in. Probably one of the most important concepts in all of aug augmented reality in the moment, uh, and it doesn't specifically have to do with just manufacturing, but we're going to connect it back to this business, is something that's being called the AR cloud. And this is, again, a term that, that may not stick. Uh, you, you may have also been, uh, heard this called the mirror world. But what, what am I talking about? What is, what is the AR cloud? The AR cloud you can think of as essentially a one-to-one -one digital representation. You could think of it as a digital twin of the entire physical world. And this piece of uh, computing infrastructure, some analysts are describing and saying that this is potentially worth trillions of dollars, more valuable than, than Google's PageRank index, more valuable than, than Facebook's social graph. And so why is that? And tomorrow in, a, in my workshop, we're, we're going to be exploring this concept at, at greater length. But essentially, this is a, a piece of technology asset that will become the way that will manage the world's information visually, spatially, and with augmented reality. Now, I can show you one example of one company. Uh, Scott Summit, who you heard from today, introduced me to the CEO. Uh, this is a London-based company, Edward Miller, who's essentially created this, this one-to-one, or he's working on building essentially this one-to-one -one digital map. So this is a digital representation of Trafalgar Square in London. And you can imagine the size of this database. This is essentially you know, a full digital copy. And ex again, this has to operate in real time. This, this doesn't show that these people are moving and you know, perhaps there's a construction site, buses are driving by. This will have to operate in real time. So the scale and scope of this is, is immense, enormous. 
But for manufacturing companies, something like these kinds of, of augmented reality clouds, these digital uh, representations, will be a new way that will organize information. This is a company called Visualix that basically gives you a way to uh, you know, store information about a piece of connected equipment you know, right there on the asset itself. If a technician needs to get information about how to conduct repairs or get a history of uh, you know, what's being stored on the device, that this, you know, this will be right there on, on the piece of equipment. And a related concept, which has been talked about today already, we heard from Tim who mentioned that uh, you know, the, the bridge that he's 3D printing will have this sort of software self-awareness, this ability for a piece of equipment to give you information. So in the case of, uh, you know, say, a wind turbine at GE, it can tell you about its steam temperature, its rotator speed, um, you know, the number of cold starts it's had this month, it can predict with some accuracy when it might break down so you can avoid expensive repairs. So these kinds of virtual recreations of, of connected assets will really provide information for, for how to navigate these, these worlds. But there's one other kind of, of virtual world and digital world that I think is really important uh, to pay attention to. And these are these sort of collaborative virtual environments that we'll be using as communication tools. And this will also transform how we as, as businesses uh, collaborate. And in augmented reality, you can start to get a sense of, of what that might look like. So this is a company called Spatial. Uh, they just came out of stealth mode a few months ago. Uh, and essentially, it allows you to create a, a three-dimensional avatar of someone based on a, an image, a 2D image that, that, that's given. And you can create a collaborative workstation where you can do design work, and you can do things that you may not ever be able to do on a traditional video communication uh, screen. So you know, the, the number of times that you had to get on a plane to go and have a collaboration session with a team of designers or uh, colleagues around the world, you will now be able to, to basically create any space into a collaborative workstation. Now this is augmented reality, but in virtual reality, fully immersive virtual reality, probably one of the most powerful experiences that I've had has been sharing experiences with other people to do all kinds of things. And one of the platforms that I've been writing about and focused on for quite a few years is a company called Altspace. And so what Altspace is doing is creating ways for people to spend time uh, in a virtual environment. I've gone to comedy shows, podcast tapings, music festivals. I'll show you what it looks like. So this was actually how I attended the presidential debate a few years ago. Every one of these avatars that you see on this screen represents someone who was at home in their own bedroom with a virtual reality headset. I could talk to them. It has spatial audio, so it feels like you can actually uh, you know, form a connection. I met people from uh, the Netherlands, from South America, from Israel, um, all across the political spectrum. The, you know, the US political environment is no less dystopi dystopian inside virtual reality, unfortunately. But this is a way to give people the ability to connect and, and, and spend time together. And so this is also going to come to, to enterprise and to how we as designers and companies uh, actually form this. So this is a company called Tsunami XR, which builds on this idea, but allows you to actually import CAD files in this sense. You can do markups, uh, add post-it notes. And so you could essentially have your designers, your best people, whether they're spread across the world, maybe they're thousands of miles apart from each other, and you don't need to physically fly them together to get them in a room to collaborate any longer. You can build and leverage this 3D spatial environment and actually collaborate in, inside these, these virtual spaces. And actually, it was just announced this week that Ford in, uh, in the US, the automotive company, is now leveraging a tool. They, they don't use Tsunami. They use a tool called Gravity Sketch. But they're now having their, their best designers collaborate from thousands of miles apart from each other. And this is, this is what's coming. So just to sort of ground us into, into where we started, again, you know, these technologies are really providing an opportunity to find exponential improvements in, in some of our, our manufacturing processes and procedures. And so this is, I think, a, a really exciting uh, uh, application area for, for these technologies that are developing at a pretty incredible speed. Now, I'll end with this idea that we, you know, we should remember that virtual realities, these digital worlds, these aren't actually new concepts. We already have you know, emails and Facebook profiles and Instagram accounts and all of these things. It's just that ever since the invention of the screen, we've been in interacting with these virtual environments through a two-dimensional window. 
You know, we, we still operate that for the most, like that for, for most of our lives. But essentially what we're doing is we're eliminating the screen. The era of the screen is, is really about to go away. We'll either step into a fully immersive version of these worlds or we'll bring these worlds into our surroundings. And for that, I think that is a really exciting reason to, to, to pay attention and, and think about where these technologies might go. So with that, I want to thank you. I really appreciate being here with you today. And uh, I look forward to spending time with you at the rest of this conference. Thank you.